Okay, so I'm Sarah McDougall. I'm head of collections and Buru, which is the short name for uh, a long uh, uh, item, the Benuri Research Unit for the study of the Jewish and immigrant contribution to British visual art since 1900. And together with my colleague, Rachel Dixon, who will be speaking in the second part of this session, um, I'm delighted to join you all today for this series of talks set up by Fiona very brilliantly during lockdown. Um, Rachel, I'm not sure if you want to introduce yourself now or afterwards. Nothing. Sorry, I, sorry no, I had to turn my mute off. So oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Okay, I can introduce myself now. Um, I'm Rachel Dixon. I'm head of curatorial services at Benary, um, senior researcher at Buru. Uh, Sarah and I have worked together over many years and have a, a specialism in the work of the emigre Jewish artists in Britain. Um, to hand back to Sarah and I'll go back on to mute. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the contribution to Scottish visual culture during the Second World War, specifically the years 1940 to 43, by two Polish Jewish emigre artists, Joseph Herman and Jankel Adler, with particular reference to two works from the Bernary Collection created in Glasgow during this period. And hopefully you can see them both on the screen there. On the left, you have Joseph Herman's Refugees, and on the right, you have Jankel Adler's Mother and Child, both created in Glasgow in 1941. So both works resonate with some of the issues already raised in the previous talks, um, including national and Jewish identities, their wartime experiences of these artists, their contribution to Glasgow exhibiting culture, and finally, their experiences as refugees. My talk, as Fiona said, follows on the two great previous sessions by Di Gardner of the McLaurin Gallery and Dr. Mia Spiro last week on the 1951 Festival of Jewish Arts at the McClellan Gallery. And borrowing Di's excellent 2014 title of Cultural Connections, I hope to make some cultural connections of my own between our various presentations before I begin. So firstly, and if we could have the next slide, Fiona. Through Fiona herself. Fiona, as she mentioned, is a long-standing friend of us all at Benary, um, both through the work of her late aunt, Hannah Frank, whose drawing son you see on the screen now. Um, I showed it, I know, but it's worth seeing again. Fiona was also for many years our fantastic intern mentor at the gallery, much missed. Um, secondly, if we could have the next slide, um, a connection between um, last week's talk by Mia and um, Jan Kladler. So um, the exhibition that she discussed, the Festival of Jewish Arts, featured on its art committee, the Ephraim Goldbergs, Ephraim was head of the Glasgow Jewish retailing company A, A Goldberg and was one of the members of the um, committee, uh, the art committee um, that organised that exhibition. Uh, and he had been persuaded uh, rather reluctantly, I think, by Benno Schatz to support these penniless artists who had just arrived in Scotland. So he commissioned Jan Adler to paint the picture you see on your screen now, a double portrait of his two young children, Myra, aged about three, Mark, aged about two and a bit. Um, it was a rather unhappy commission for all concerned, <laughs> as Adler resented the commission, complaining he was not a journeyman, and he didn't sign the work, he left it unsigned. Goldbergs considered the commission itself a charitable act and they disliked the portrait and they left it hidden in the family's attic for many years until it was discovered by uh, the children in it, uh, then grown up and proudly hung by the next generation in the living room. 
but I think you can see that um, it may not have been what uh, the Goldbergs would have expected, because although there's some naturalism to the figures, uh, there's also a lot of continental European influences there. Um, and clearly, uh, it was a rather a surprise for them to be dealing with an artist of uh, Jankel Adler's uh, calibre. So my own personal connection, if we could have the next slide, uh, as Di mentioned in her talk, was through the McLaurin Gallery tour of part of the 2011 touring exhibition that I curated on Herman's early work, which looked at his tumultuous journey through four European cities during the years 1938 to 44. He was born in Warsaw in 1911 into a poor Jewish family um, he experienced a lot of anti-Semitism as a young man, as a young artist, and he also had very left-wing views. So one way or another, he was always in trouble. And his mother encouraged him to leave Warsaw, which he did in 1938, never to return and never to see his family again. He went to Brussels, perhaps surprisingly, uh, but he had an admiration for the Flemish primitives, and while he was there, he embraced Flemish Expressionism. Uh, and then he was forced to leave there uh, when the Nazis invaded Belgium. He made his way through France, uh, was put on a boat bound for Liverpool and ended up by chance in Glasgow. So the exhibition uh, that we did in London, uh, it was then the Glasgow part of that that toured to become part of Dye's exhibition at the McLaurin Gallery, and it was a great pleasure to work with her on that occasion. So moving on to the two artists themselves, Herman arrived then in Glasgow in June 1940, knowing no one and speaking no English, until he arrived at the home of Benno Schott. I'm not going to speak much about Benno because I know both Di and Mia have done so already. Um, but he was obviously this crucial figure in both the Glasgow art scene and the Glasgow Jewish culture. Um, so Herman arrived on his doorstep, having got his address from a library, um, and he described the home as battleship grey on the outside, but inside all rose and warmth. He was welcomed en famille immediately and later learning that his old friend Jan Gladler, whom he had already known in Warsaw, was also in Glasgow, the three Yiddish speakers quickly became companions. Herman and Adler then formed a separate group, a conspiracy of two, he called them, and each provided a direct conduit to their Polish Jewish roots at a time when they were both separated from their native country and also their families. We could have the next slide. Oh, okay, I think I'm slightly out of sequence, never mind. Um, so Herman spent two and a half years in Glasgow, 1940 to 43, and these were the most productive years of his early career. For the first time since the mid thirties, he had a settled residence in what he referred to as that gaunt Scottish city. And this provoked an outpouring of work often of startling colour and vivacity, although many of the drawings in pen and ink uh, and gouache, uh, as you see here, are also uh, in black and white. He was using just cheap and available materials. As a refugee, of course, he had nothing um, and had to make best use of what he could find. The works themselves are quite unlike anything in his later oeuvre. The greater part draws strongly on his Eastern European Jewish heritage, as well as his expressionist roots. And they address specifically Jewish themes. We saw some of the paintings just now on the screen, uh, and also this notable series of nostalgic drawings, which variously depict Jewish themes. Um, they include family life, Jewish customs, everyday street life, such as musicians, the work on the far left here, couple, is a particular favourite of mine. It was given very recently to the Benary, uh, and it's very reminiscent of the drawings he did of his parents. 
And I think that suggestion is further underpinned by the fact that he inscribed the work when he gave it to a friend as a fragment of myself. I find these drawings incredibly moving. So he made them uh, in watercolor or gouache, as I've said, or pen and ink. They're fluid, they're skillfully sketched, but they're largely done from memory or imagination. And they're strengthened by an atmospheric application of wash, which he later recorded he was using here for the first time. He wrote, as for the drawings themselves, they too followed a free course. Like a tightrope walker, I put my trust in the instinct for balance. And drawing lines was a hazardous way of getting to the depth of a memory. Today, after so many years, I look at these drawings as though they were done by someone else. But deep down, I know that they are a part of me, a memory of memory. We could have the next slide. However, it was no doubt after receiving the devastating news in 1942 that his entire family had been exterminated in the Russo ghetto, that the memory of memory sequence darkened to include images like these of pogroms. Uh, and the next slide. The painting refugees which Henry acquired in 2014, also dates from this crucial period in Glasgow. It was hidden in a private collection for more than 60 years and believed lost. His son David thought that it had been destroyed, since Herman had destroyed most of the work from this early period in 1948, partly because he consciously rejected the influence of Chagall, which is notable in these early pictures, but also no doubt because it was such a painful subject for him. Refugees would be exhibited at Herman's first solo exhibition in Glasgow in October 1941. You can see the catalogue there on the screen and it was listed there as number 10. Um, the exhibition was later reprised in Edinburgh in February to March 1942 and it was included in the catalogue. So like the others we've seen, it also draws strongly on this Eastern European Jewish heritage uh, and depicts Warsaw itself. However, the refugee family is both a personal and a wider symbol uh, of peoples uprooted and forced into exile by the upheavals of the Second World War. The family's unknown fate is symbolized by the cat with a mouse dangling from its jaw you note the bloodied mouse there. The treatment of the figures reflects Herman's admiration for Katie Colvitz, while the fearful child with her hand in her mouth is reminiscent of Goya and specifically the black painting. Goya was an artist Herman hugely admired um, and at his home in Warsaw he had uh, a copy of a self-portrait lithograph of Goya's on his wall. So during this period, Herman and Adler would both contribute to a revival of the artistic scene in Glasgow, which art historian Dennis Farr has called a surprising resurgence of vitality in all the creative arts in the city at a time which could hardly have seemed less propitious for such a revival. It was spearheaded by Scottish colourist J.D. Ferguson, whom Herman described as Scottish Scotland's leading Cezannist, and his wife Margaret Morris, founder of the eponymous dance school, and in August 1940 of the Celtic Ballet. Ferguson founded the New Art Club in December 1940 to provide a platform for modern art for Glasgow's progressive artists, and it would be succeeded by the New Scottish Group in 1942. Artist members held an exhibition of their work each month. There was no selection committee. Qualified and self-taught artists, young and old, hung side by side and members freely discussed each other's work. Ferguson and Morris, being older than other members, tended to show their earlier works for fairer comparison. Despite having only recently arrived, Adler and Herman were two of the New Art Club's earliest and most influential members, helping to inject, quotes, a new spirit and sense of professionalism into the Glasgow art world. Dennis Farr suggests that Adler's influence could be felt in the strong expressionist flavour common to much of the work shown at the group. 
and its successor. Adler and Herman have also been credited with inspiring the birth of the new art club's short-lived offshoot, the Centre, which opened at 7 Scott Street, founded by the left-wing aristocrat David Archer, and later, later described as a sort of aspiring ICA in Glasgow. Established with funds raised by the sale of paintings donated by new art club members, and decorated downstairs by Adler and upstairs by Herman, the centre combined a gallery, bookshop and coffee room. Its first secretary was R. Crombie Saunders, later editor of Scottish Art and Letters. During its 18-month duration, it held literary events, including poetry readings by Dylan Thomas and four solo exhibitions, one each on Adler and Herman and the two Scottish painters, Crosby and Andrew Taylor Elder. The latter was much influenced by the Eastern European melancholy of Weltschmerz, discernible in the work of Herman and Adler. Sadly, no catalogues from these exhibitions have survived, nor has the centre itself, and it's been suggested that its demise coincided with Adler's departure from Glasgow in 1942. I could have the next slide, please. Herman was also among the new art club artist members who also designed for the Glasgow Unity Theatre Company, an amalgam of amateur theatre groups with a staunchly socialist outlook and a commitment to working class audiences. The others included the sculptor, sorry, the Scottish sculptor and later filmmaker and designer, Helen Bigger, whose sketch is seen here. She was a close friend of Herman's and also posed for him. And his theatre project, We Are This Land, a Russian mask, which was an ambitious historical survey of Russian history from pre-1914 through to 1941, that is, as Herman himself saw it. And it comprises 11 beautifully preserved designs in a dedicated portfolio. When I took these out for the exhibition in 2011, they were sort of as crisp and as colourful and still smelling of paint as though they'd just been done the day before. So you see four of the designs on the screen um, and each one represents an archetypal character. So on the top we have two villains denoted by their colours shown in opposing pairs. The white is the western capitalist and the yellow the eastern capitalist. While the brown Nazi down below um, is um, juxtaposed with the hero the communist in the red uh, on the bottom left. Um, other working people are shown as archetypes rather than individuals, peasants, workmen, etc. characteristic of Herman's lifelong sympathy for and celebration of working people. This piece was first performed at the Unity Theatre Glasgow in October 1941 and repeated in February 1942. Have the next slide, please. In 1942, Herman also conceived the decor, costume, set, and narrative of his own ballet, Ballet of the Palette, staged by the Celtic Ballet Club, which had been founded in 1940 by Margaret Morris. Four designs for this semi surrealist extravaganza survive. Uh, Herman conceived it as a 30 minute fantasy centered upon the big brush who you see on the right and the energetic little brush with a corps de ballet representing the colours, including blue and pink, which you see on the right. The opening scene shows a backdrop of an unfinished painting in Herman's favoured blue, the colour he used most in Glasgow to evoke a lost Warsaw. The moon motif in the top left corner is also common to this work, and the stage itself is represented as a palette with each colour returning to the, sorry, with each of the colours playing a symbolic role. In the later stages of the ballet, which we can see on the next slide, Herman conceived each colour returning to the stage, wearing a mask, grotesque or tragic, but showing that it was no longer a mere colour, but now a distinct personality. This was reflected in his strikingly original costume designs, as seen in Robert J. Anderson's remarkable contemporaneous photographs. With their pointed hats and masked faces, figures also clearly relate to Herman's enduring interest 
and the carnival element of the Jewish festival of Purim. Although the ballet was well received and performed at least 15 times in 1942, enjoying two revivals in 1944 and 45, it was Herman's only recorded project for the Celtic ballet. Turning now to Adler, if we could have the next slide. Adler arrived in Scotland on the 22nd of June, 1940. He was 16 years older than Herman. He'd been born in Poland in 1895. He'd had a successful career, first in Poland, where he was a founder member of Young Yiddish, a group exploring their Jewish identity. Uh, also in Germany, where he'd worked in Dusseldorf with Paul Clay. He'd worked in Paris with Stanley William Hayter in Atelier 17. He'd got to know also Picasso. And these two great artists, Picasso and Paul Clay, were his great heroes and his great influences. And we can see their influence, particularly in this um, fantastic work, Mother and Child, which was painted in Glasgow, uh, and which reminds us very much of Guernica, uh, Picasso's Guernica, painted just a couple of years before. So Adler, after he arrived, was initially sent to an internment camp for a few months. Uh, Herman had also undergone some sort of internment. Um, accounts of this is, uh, is very, very vague for both artists. Um, but we know that Adler was plagued by uncertainty and ill health and discharged partly due to a heart condition on the 23rd of January, 1941. His life companion, Betty Kohlhaas Adler, had chosen to remain in Germany during the war with their daughter, Nina. He was hounded by the Gestapo, but narrowly escaped a concentration camp, and both of them did survive. However, um, Adler was constantly worried about them um, and about the fate of his nine siblings. Um, his wife and daughter would survive the war, but only at the end would he learn um, of the loss of his entire, the rest of his entire family. So his uneasiness at this separation haunts his work in exile, as we can see very clearly in this work here. Although some prints and drawings survive from 1940, most of his documented British work dates from 1941 in Scotland for obvious reasons. In 2019, Rachel and I gathered together a number of Adler's works from his Scottish and English periods at Benury for a snapshot exhibition uh, marking the 80th anniversary of his death in 1949. Uh, and we called the exhibition Yankel Adler, a degenerate artist in Britain, 1940 to 49, drawing on research we'd carried out in 2018 for the Adler retrospective at Wuppertal. Um, Adler had been declared de degenerate by the Nazi regime uh, in his absence, and his work was included in the 1937 Entartet Kunstshow, founded um, by the Nazis in 1937 in Munich. Through shots, again, Adler was introduced to a close network of Jewish supporters. Among them were two Glasgow furriers, Moray Glasser, who purchased this work, and a JP, Fred Nettler, a prominent Zionist who later moved to Israel, and both were long-standing supporters of Jewish causes. They agreed to finance Adler initially for six weeks to produce enough paintings for a private exhibition that Schotts held in his own studio. Uh, in preparation for this, Schotts cleaned out and redecorated the studio, wrote many letters of invitation to business friends, provided tea for all the visitors and noted that quite a few paintings were sold. Afterwards, the two artists sadly fell out, but he continued to make sure that Adler was supported by the Jewish community in Glasgow. If we could have the next slide. These two uh, portraits of women typify Adler's work in the Scottish period. Often a lone female is depicted either clothed or nude, sometimes with a cat, often without any specific environment. Um, these sort of figures are a motif in his work from the 20s onwards and are presented in a range of 
media, often experimental. Sometimes he incorporates elements like sand or earth into the background or suggests um, a collage as on the left. Adler's women are conduits for his artistic influences, including Leger and Picasso, and sometimes incorporate elements of surrealism. Um, we can see Picasso's influence particularly here, uh, but often a subdued palette, um, say for flashes of crimson, such as that in the ribbon on the girl on the left, or the hat on the woman on the right. The girl on the left suffered burns and uh, on her face, which Adler um, depicts by using a textured surface. We could have the next slide. Still lifes were also a regular motif for Adler. Um, if we could have the next slide, Fiona, um, and um, have the roots back in his, thank you, early depictions of the Friday night supper Sabbath table. Um, Adler was an excellent cook and in spite of wartime privations, delighted in preparing a feast of a whole week's rations for Herman and Ferguson in his Glasgow studio. He covered the table with a prayer shawl, used two large beer bottles as candlesticks and simply pushed his paints to the other end of the table. This composition is laid out like a last supper. You can only recognise a fish in the uh, centre of the composition. Uh, while the kaleidoscopic tabletop is surrounded by jewel toned prisms and triangular forms in the background possibly represent the supper guest. Another still life, uh, Adler collects various elements suggestive of a traditional life. Uh, if we could have the next slide. Thank you. Um, we see shapes resembling fruit placed on a windowsill or tabletop but treated in an increasingly abstract manner. Art historian Ziva Amishai Meisels has suggested that Adler's return to abstraction in this period, originally stimulated by his friendship in Dusseldorf with Paul Clay, reflects an attempt to express his feelings as a refugee. After Clay's death, Adler wrote a powerful tribute to him in which he declared that Clay, when beginning a picture, had the excitement of a Columbus moving to the discovery of a new continent. And this was an excitement that Rachel and I definitely felt when making this exhibition that Adler had certainly shared. We could have the next slide, please. But other works engaged directly with his experiences of suffering. And in 1942, if we could have the next slide. After learning, thank you, that his entire family had been murdered in the Warsaw Ghetto. Joseph Herman suffered a breakdown and it was Adler who nursed him back to health with maternal tenderness. He later presented him with the black edged painting you see here, entitled Orphan, which depicts two figures, one clutching a letter imprisoned behind a bar. The canvas is surrounded by a black border reminiscent of mourning, mourning cards and Herman himself understood the work as a symbolic double portrait of himself and Adler. He hung it over the mant his mantelpiece for the rest of his life. Next to that you also see a photograph of Herman in his London studio some years later and in the background you can see a talit, a prayer shawl hanging um, in the background. This was also given to him by Adler and like the painting, cherished it for the rest of his life. Um, for the reasons I've just given, the work The Orphans has traditionally been dated to 1942. However, we can see that it was included in Adler's second solo exhibition in Glasgow, and this was held at Annan's Gallery in Socky Hall Street uh, and opened in June 1941, comprising 24 works. Ferguson wrote the catalogue forward, welcoming Adler as an artist whose work could be found, in whose work could be found, sorry, great force and extreme sensibility, a great contribution to Scotland's fight for free expression in art and liberation from the idea that photographic and memorial accuracy are standards for judging painting. These works of Adler's are some of the best modern paintings I've seen. Is Scotland hospitable enough 
to see their great qualities and benefit by them. A local paper reviewing the ex exhibition echoed this point. What may be questioned is whether this type of art, which originated from foreign and different conditions, will be appreciated in the Scotland of today. Apart from orphans, Adler's other works included the death of Eric Mushaum, um, commemorating the Jewish writer and anarchist murdered by the Nazis in Orenburg concentration camp, uh, and other works with titles such as Anguish, Death of a Peasant, and The Mother and Child, which we've already seen, demonstrating that he too is drawing upon his Jewish heritage and recent dramatic experiences. The Jewish Chronicle reported in August 1941 that two of Adler's paintings, Jewish Still Life and Death of a Martyr, that was the portrait of Eric Mushaum, had been presented to the Glasgow Institute, but sadly so far it has not been possible to trace them. If I could have the next slide. So I'd like to finish with a very brief look at the Jewish Art Exhibition, which opened in December 1942 at the Glasgow Jewish Institute, 93 South Portland Street, organised once again by shops and assisted by Herman, and in which Adler's work was also included, as well as, as well as their own, alongside that of many of the best-known 20th century Jewish artists. Um, a few were dead, but the majority were still alive and then based between them in Britain, Palestine and America. In his introduction, Schlotz explained that the staging of the exhibition was an act of Jewish cultural identity. Today, when on the continent of Europe, Jewish life and culture are being systematically and brutally uprooted and destroyed, there is an urgent necessity for Jews elsewhere to demonstrate their faith in themselves and the future. It was a remarkable feat, I hardly need say, that he was able to bring together such a collection of artists uh, in wartime, and Herman later wrote that this exhibition introduced many of the Glasgow public to these European Jewish artists for the first time. So there were 24 exhibitors in all, showing 44 works. Most showed two works each. You see just one page from the catalogue on the right, and they included many Echo de Paris artists hailing from Eastern Europe, among them Chagall, Soutine, and Modigliani, First and Secoration, Second Generation, so-called Whitechapel Boys, David Bomberg, Mark Gertler, from the older generation, Alfred Walmark, and by association, Jacob Epstein, from the north of England, Jacob Kramer, Bernard Meninsky, Philip Navieski, and also, very importantly, the contemporary refugees from continental Europe fleeing from Nazism, not only Adler and Hermann, but also from Germany, Martin Bloch, Hans Feibusch, and many others. Just two women were included, Vera Morozov, a Russian who'd also been in Paris, and the other was Oravida, the daughter of Lucien Pizarro and granddaughter of Camille Pizarro, both of whom were also included. Lenders included the Aberdeen and Glasgow Art Galleries, Leeds City Art Gallery, the Benuri Gallery, two prestigious independent London galleries, the, Lece the Leicester and the Lefebvre, who would shortly show Herman's work, and a number of private collectors, including Maury Glasser and Fred Nettler in Glasgow, Alexander Margulies in London. Margulies was later chairman of Benuri and a co-founder in 1942 with his brother Benzian of the O'Hell Centre, um, a centre for political, social and cultural activities for Polish Jewry, but extended to all refugees. The Chagall was lent by Peter Watson. He was a significant English collector who also owned works by Clay and Picasso and financially supported British neo-romantic artists such as John Craxton and Lucian Freud. In 1943, Watson also bought Adler's impressive but melancholy response to the Warsaw Uprising, beginning of the revolt, which I think we can see on the next slide, from his first solo London exhibition at the Redfern Gallery. At the Jewish Art Exhibition, Adler showed two oils, 
uh, including once more the mother and child. Um, if we could have the final slide. Oh, sorry, almost final slide. <laughs> At the Jewish art exhibition, as I've said, Adler showed his mother and child. Um, if we could just go on for a moment, um, Fiona. Uh, thank you. Uh, which you see again here. Um, in this, I mentioned the influence of Guernica. We see this tense but tender mother cradling her child protectively. The theme is also highly resonant of Adler's own family separation, and one of his most powerful Scottish words. It also directly influenced Herman. If we go back one slide for just a second, he reworked the theme in three images of a mother and child fleeing, known collectively as memory of a pogrom. Thank you, and we then go to the final slide. In August 1943, Adler and Herman both provided illustrations which were shown side by side in an article about Jewish painting in the Yiddish publication, Losh and Labour, Language and Life, edited by the Polish Yiddish poet Avram Stencil. And this is Herman's on the left. It shows that both continue to engage with their Jewish roots even after their move from Glasgow to London. 1933 was also the year that both departed for London. Adler, in fact, had already located in mid-1942 to Kirkubrisha to an artist colony in preparation for his London exhibition in 1943. In 1968, the Scottish Arts Council put on an exhibition called Painting in Glasgow 1940-46, to in which both painters were included. Herman wrote the um, catalogue introduction and acknowledged how, together with Ferguson, he and Adler had contributed something to the Scottish scene, if not to Scottish art. And it is good to know that our presence in Scotland is not altogether forgotten. I feel this is a very modest description for their achievements uh, in Glasgow during these years. I've only had time to scratch the surface of this topic today, but I hope I have de demonstrated something of the valuable influence of both artists on wartime Scottish art scene, both specifically to Jewish and to wider visual culture. And I now hand over to Rachel. Thank you. Rachel, straight on to you. Oh, okay. Um, I just want to say, um, also, well, that's, Sarah, thank you for a fantastic yeah. um, talk, uh, followed wonderfully on from Mia's last week on exhibition culture. I'd just like to say mine really isn't a talk. It's really just a 10-minute postscript um, looking at one main exhibition and a subsidiary exhibition uh, that caught my eye really about the time the lockdown started. So. I've really done very little research, having <clears throat> not had access to archives, but there's some ideas in there that I hope you'll find of interest. And I also thought I do have one Scottish connection. I was a student um, at the University of Edinburgh and at Edinburgh Art School, and I, it was so long ago that I sort of forget <laughs> about it, but of course it was a very formative part of my life. Um, right, so Fiona, you've got my little PowerPoint. Um, yes. It, in due course, um, I can ask for it. We don't need to look at anything for the moment. Oh, sorry, you don't want to. Oh, well, uh, it doesn't matter. People can look at a, a blank screen just for the, the moment. Okay, well, I'll, I'll stop sharing. This is the okay. time. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, thank you to Fiona for wonderful organising and all the technological wizardry uh, to our attendees and for Sarah for her amazing preceding talk. My short postscript, I hope, dovetails both with Mia's fascinating talk last week on Glasgow's 1951 Festival of Jewish Arts, and with Sarah's focus on the Polish artist emigres, Janko Adler and Joseph Herman. By looking at um, the earlier decade and two art exhibitions held in wartime Scotland, which had a high Polish content and an unheralded Jewish presence therein. Uh, the first exhibition, which I'll mention only briefly, is the 1940 exhibition of paintings and drawings by Polish artists held at T&R Annan and Sons Gallery at 518 Sochigol Street, which we have already heard mentioned um, in connection with Adler as they hosted his solo show 
in June 1941. Uh, this exhibition was under the auspices of the Glasgow Committee of the Polish Relief Fund. The second exhibition, the more important, is the 1941 The Art of the Allies, which was a huge exhibition of almost 500 exhibits, first held at the National Gallery of Scotland in Edinburgh in the absence of the permanent collection, and then at Kelvin Grove Gallery in Glasgow, where it received over 24,000 visitors. My interest in these exhibitions was first raised when tracing a century-long presence of Polish émigré artists, both Jewish and non-Jewish, in Britain for an exhibition held at Benuri in summer 2017. And it soon became apparent that a significant Polish presence in Scotland, of which I'm sure you are all aware, was due partly to the trajectory of the two wings of the Polish army in exile. Firstly, after the fall of France, and then bolstered in the immediate post-war period. The army in the West under General Sikorsky, which was demobbed in summer 1940, and the Anders army in the East, which started arriving six years later, both had enlightened policies of education, which helped their soldier artists, amongst other professionals, prepare to return to everyday life after the war. And there's a common uh, misconception that Jews were not part of the Polish army, but this is absolutely not the case. I mean, we've certainly seen Adler. Um, following the fall of France in June 1940, 17,000 Polish soldiers, including Adler, were evacuated to Scotland, where they were housed temporarily in camps, which Sarah referenced, um, in the borders and South Lanarkshire, before moving to more permanent bases in Fife, Angus, and Perthshire. The 1940 exhibition, of course, was very much a civilian show. And so, you know, if we could have the first slide beyond the title, please. Right, okay. So, share screen, Rachel Dixon. There we go. Um, so this is very much a civilian show. Uh, the Annans Gallery, um, which was originally established as a firm of photographers in the 1800s, had gradually assumed the role of fine art dealers, holding exhibitions since the 1870s and gradually moving from photographing paintings to dealing in them. As we've heard, they hosted Adler's show in June 1941 in their elegant purpose-built gallery designed in 1901 by Honeyman, Kepi and Mackintosh. The exhibition catalogue is undated, but the year of the exhibition has been confirmed by Henrik Gottlieb's archivist, um, so we don't know the month. But the list of artists and the title of works suggests that it's early in the year, at least before the fall of France and the arrival of the Polish soldiers. It has no introduction, so without access to the Annan archives, I'm, un I'm unable to confirm how or why individual artists were selected and if indeed that is recorded. All we can see are the participants, their choice of media and the sale prices of the works. And we can see that Topolsky's drawings are priced as highly as Gottlieb's oils. And no lender is identified save for the Polish ambassador. As to the five exhibitors, we have Henrik Gottlieb, Joseph Nathanson, Felix Topolsky, Vaslav Zabadowski and Marek Zulowski. Two are Jewish, Gottlieb and Topolsky, although neither were observant like Herman and Adler, who were very orthodox, um, but rather both were from wealthy and assimilated backgrounds. And a third, Marek Zuawski, had a young Jewish wife, fellow Pole, the artist Helena Korn. And um, he is represented rather anonymously given the time of acquisition in the Benary collection. All three, Gottlieb, Topolsky, and Zuwaski, as civilians, found themselves stranded in Britain at the outbreak of war, the invasion and occupation of Poland, meaning that they could not return home. No subject offered by these young cosmopolitans gives any hint of Jewish identity. Gottlieb had been painting in Cornwall with his new English wife, as his exhibits attest. Topolsky was originally sent to Britain to report on the 1935 Silver Jubilee of George V. And his works, judging by their titles, 
include images of British royalty, possible caricatures on nationalism, and informative wartime sketches. Zulawski, who is represented with scenes mainly of London and some portraiture, including a portrait of Topolsky, had returned to Britain from Paris in 1939, having also left Poland in 1936 in order to paint abroad. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? By May 1941, Polish soldier artists based in Scotland were given permission to exhibit in the art of the Allies. The exhibition was described in the Scotsman on the 16th of May 1941 as, quote, undoubtedly one of the most interesting ever held in Scotland. Organised by the British Council Scottish Office, it seems to have been the initiative of one Henry Harvey Wood, who joined the British Council in 1940 to establish cultural contacts with and outlets for the allies of various nations stationed in Scotland. To this end, the British Council, in tandem with the Allied government in exile, founded the so-called National Houses in Scotland, the Scottish Polish House, the Scottish Czechoslovak, Scottish French, Scottish American Centre, all of which were later replaced by Edinburgh International House. Wood was also involved in the founding of the Edinburgh Festival between 1945 and 47, and was a patron of Alexander Ziv, another Polish soldier artist of Jewish heritage, whose background was described by Douglas Hall as, quote, like families of the upper classes, they had ceased to be observant without converting to Roman Catholicism. The catalogue forward was written by the assistant chairman of the British Council, Lieutenant Colonel John Chancellor, and I just quote the exhibition's vision. Now that so many of our allies maintain their freedom on British soil, the council is doing all it can to give those foreigners who are welcome visitors here an opportunity of getting to know and appreciate Britain's contribution to European civilization. He continues, quote, but for such an understanding to be fruitful, it must be reciprocal. The British people should be allowed to see that neither war nor exile has destroyed the spirit or the vitality of the allied nations. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, the sheer scale of the exhibition is impressive. Eight allied countries were represented, with Poland as the, the Poles as the largest cohort. The number of nationalities would increase in the touring versions of the exhibition um, as America entered the war and Chinese and Russian artists were also included. Um, in this version, this first version, um, there are 428 catalogue entries, which is enormous. Um, and this clearly includes around 340 works of art supported by a tranche of around 90 architectural plans and photographs. But there seems to be no logic to their presentation. You'll get a sense of that um, seeing the pages on the screen. So they were neither presented by nationality nor alphabetically in any way. And each artist's work was often spread around the catalog rather than only being grouped you know, together by artist. A small number of key works were reproduced in the large pa last pages of the catalog, including Topolsky's caricature on Hitler, which we can see on the left of the screen where he's described as a hair battler. A 2005 PhD thesis suggests that although some of the work based on contemporary reproductions in the studio was mediocre, this of course was not the point of the endeavour. Its purpose was to celebrate the spirit of camaraderie that united the allied nations and the principle of freedom of expression. Some notable participants such as Oskar Kokoschka and the sculptor Ivan Mestrovich already had international reputations and others, including Topolsky, would soon develop likewise, particularly following his first-hand recording of some of the most important and harrowing visual testimony relating to the liberation of the camps in 1945. Topolsky had the most works of any artist in the exhibition, 20, and it's interesting to note um, that number 299, you can see on the right-hand side, um, is entitled The Jew, an, an exhibit slotted in between Isaac Newton and Chelsea pensioners, all in pen and wash, 
perhaps suggesting a commonality of subject, all aged wise gentlemen. It's not surprisingly, the Jew is not illustrated. So I base this assumption on the depiction of the central figure in Topolsky's powerful commentary on wartime Britain. If I could have the next slide, please, Fiona. Um, this is a, thank you. This is an oil dated 1943 on the left hand side, entitled Old England. Um, you can see in the centre somewhat of a caricature, an elderly, long haired, bearded, shtetl Jew with a beaked nose, swathed in heavy robes, and under a deep brim soft hat. And then the image was reprised, but with the central figures of the elderly Jew removed and replaced by a pair, a rotund Churchillian character and an archetypal English gent in top hat and tails. The Topolsky's 1947 lithograph version produced for school prints, the series of school prints, entitled This England, um, which of course invokes Britain's long history and depicts a victory procession full of pomp and pageantry. The exhibition also provided an opportunity to see work by the Polish Jewish designer George Him, who had arrived in Britain with his design partner from Poland, um, Jan Levitt. They'd arrived in 1937 at the invitation of the publishers Lund Humphreys. Him was born Jersey Himmelfarb in 1900 in Łódź, and he had studied Roman law in Moscow and completed a PhD at the University of Bonn on the comparative history of religions before studying at the Leipzig Academy of Graphic Art. Returning to Poland, oh. he shortened his name to him in 1933. Working with Jan Levitt as Lewitt Levitt him, the two established a distinctive and often humorous design style combining cubist and surrealist elements. And if I could have the next slide, please, Fiona. So the exhibition included works by each of Levitt and him individually, and also as the duo Levitt him. Um, Him's uh, work as a single artist includes um, Drill at Cowall, which suggests a sketch of the Polish army in France. Um, Levitt's um, single artist contribution um, is a garage still life in bottles. But as Levitt him, they presented a small group of sporting themed gouaches. Um, you can see some of the titles on the left. Uh, Trouble on the playing field, footballers and grandstands. And these subjects were clearly close to their collective heart, as in 1939, Levitt him had published through Country Life Press, a children's short story book entitled The Football's Revolt, a charming tale of the poor football the annual match between Kickford and Goldbridge, which was then reprinted by the emigre Sylvan Press in 1944. The exhibition also contained a single work by an artist identified only by his surname, Bauernfreund, the family name of two Czech Jewish artist brothers, Alexander and Jacob, but it's unclear which of the two um, was the painter. They were born respectively in 1904 and 1915 in what is now Czechoslovakia. Both emigrated to England, uh, Jacob in 1939, and he became the better known artist, changing his name to Born Friend during the war. And his work is now well represented in the Benary collection. The still life painting by the mysterious Bauernfreund in the exhibition was lent by a Mr. Eisler, who seems to have been a prominent lender to the show, but I haven't yet been able to find out anything about him. Henrik Gottlieb was represented by five works, including a Cornish scene and work number 105, which was entitled White House in Hampstead, a location in London which we now recognise as an epicentre of the emigre and modernist community in North London, and where Gottlieb himself lived briefly. Under the auspices of SEMA, the Council for Education in Music and Arts, the precursor to the Arts Council, the Allied exhibition was subsequently adapted and toured in different smaller formats throughout England, Wales and Northern Ireland during 1942 and 43. For example, 199 works were shown in the Welsh venue, while Jankel Adler participated in the 1942 version held in London and was the first artist listed in the catalogue, 
as the entries were now organized alphabetically. I will end there. As I say, this has only been a brief introduction to this important group of allied exhibitions, which provide a valuable source of information relating to emigre, both Jewish and non-Jewish artist contributors, which of course exactly mirrors the current focus of Benuri and its ongoing research as the newly established Benuri Research Unit for the study of Jewish and emigre contribution to British visual culture since 1900. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, both of you. It's been just beautiful.